Okay. Welcome everyone to our coach clinic, Cultivating Team Culture, featuring Kyle McGoffin and Stephen Ritterbush. This will be recorded, so um, please post any questions in the chat that you want us to answer live, and then I'll follow up with an email with any links or recording or the recording link as well. Um, so here we go. So Kyle McGoffin is the physical education teacher and health department chair at Ralph C. Mahar Regional School in Orange, Massachusetts. He's been teaching at Mahar since 2009 after graduating from Springfield College and obtaining a master's degree from Ohio University. Kyle has experience in traditional athletics as both an inter interscholastic and collegiate athlete, as well as coaching experience in a variety of sports. Kyle has history has a history of creating new sports teams as he started his high school school high school boys volleyball team while in high school. Ooh, that's cool. And created the first varsity level esport team in Western Massachusetts. His Rocket League and League of Legends teams have made the playoffs in every season they have competed with play versus. Kyle has spoken on panels to expand esports at the college level and is passionate about creating new programs and opportunities for student athletes. Kyle, thank you. That was a lot, and we're really excited to have you. Our other panelist is Thanks. Steven Ritterbush. Many esports coaches have more than one position they fill in their institution. Not many hold a dozen positions across half a dozen organizations. Steven Ritterbush has included overseeing the growth of an esports program on that list since 2013, when he co-founded a student organization for students at the University of Arkansas. He is still in that role today. In addition to his work history, which ranges from being part of an award-winning startup to getting certified and working as a bounty hunter to pay for college. Stephen holds two master's degree in business administration and information systems, both received from the Walton College of Business. His current focus when not donating his time or performing his official duties includes studying for a third master's degree and working on resources to aid esports coaches and students in the United States and Canada. Whew. Thank you, Stephen. Amazing. We also have a third guest that popped up as well. I don't have a bio for you, Justin, but Justin will be here to help answer questions that pop up as well. He has been a part of our high school super coach program and is now switching over to collegiate. All right. And then I will give it over to whoever, whoever is starting this portion. Uh, that will be me. Um, and this first slide, I'm gonna talk about cultural beginnings. Um, and you know, I, I've had the experience of starting teams. Uh, my esports experience starts in 2018 when Play Versus first started with their season zero. And I had a conversation with a student about just starting an esport club. And it turned into everything I'm doing now and quitting coaching all traditional sports in order to, to coach esports. Um, but that all started with a conversation with a student. And so my first little bullet point here is build connection to your students. So in terms of developing a culture within your team is you need to make your team, not make your team, you need to connect with your team. You need to build in a relationship with your students that they know that they can have an open line of communication between you and the other players. I found out that being called a boomer was not the greatest thing in the world my first year. And that's when I learned about relatability and the fact that I need to understand what they're going through. And as someone who had zero experience in esports, I hadn't the faintest clue of how to relate to a kid that I assumed was just playing in his parents' basement with the lights off every day after school. So relatability to me, I had to start thinking like a 16 to 18 year old and what they're thinking about playing a video game and usually over a headset and not face to face with somebody. So when we got a team of five guys playing League of Legends in a room, it was quite the experience to see them interact when they had never played League of Legends in a room with somebody in their entire life. Um, so that's when I learned about building connection to students and relatability and how what I said to them had to carry five different people's personalities within that first week of esports. Um, we had kids that have never played, and this goes to the second bullet, had never played on a team sport before. They hadn't played any traditional athletics. Literally that esport League of Legends practice in the September of 2018 was chaos because I didn't know what was happening. They didn't know what was happening. And 
for us, it, we needed to learn how to work as a team. And none of those kids had learned to work as a team. So it was just, I, I pulled into my phys ed bag of tricks and we were doing team building exercises like you'd see, you know, in a, in a book of, you know, let's stack as many cups as we can with marshmallows and, and spaghetti things to make a tower, just learning how to be a team member. So sometimes in a new program, you got to go back to the basics and just learn how to be a team member. That kind of relates to my esport history or lack thereof. When I was first starting, I turned the reins over to a bunch of 17 year old kids for the most part because they knew more than I did. And what I found with that, A, it's scary as all hell to give all the reins away to a 17 year old kid and say, hey man, we're gonna figure out how to play this game. But it also gave them a, a, a sense of entitlement and a sense of empowerment in the fact that I was trusting them with their judgment. So most of the decisions we made we sat down as a group and we talked about it. And because I didn't have that much history, I found it was a benefit to us because I had to rely on them and we could have communications. And they were teaching me about esports, and I was teaching them about how to be a team. And that's where we sort of made this culture of growth in our first year when we all knew that we had something to offer and that we had to rely on each other to learn those different things. And understanding a role of a team was a huge thing. I had one person that did not want to be told what to do. He was a mid laner. He was the best kid on the team. You just had to ask him. He would have told you 17 times how he was better than you, but he wouldn't take any advice. He would take over the game. And it was just very frustrating as everyone else that this kid was just overpowering everyone else. And the person that started the team and my assistant coach now just couldn't get over the fact that he couldn't be a team player. So we had to understand that maybe even though he was the best player on the team, he wasn't a right fit as a role as a member of our team and that's a hard decision as a coach to make to say hey if you can't understand that you're going to have to be a mid laner who listens to the jungler who's shot calling we're going to have issues um that's what we ran into it's like basketball you got a six man i mean they give awards for a six man in the nba and it's just a support player and and like league of legends finding somebody to play support sometimes can be a, a hard thing to do because there's no glory in being the support player it's a lineman on the football team there's no glory but if you create a culture where everyone's role on the team is celebrated, you know, if you hear Tom Brady talk about he only played well because his line was well, then you have a team that's really working together. So if you have somebody who says, I didn't play well because of so-and-so, right there, you've created a culture where they're not working as a team. In the beginning of a program, all I'm going to say on that one is you got to listen to your players. When I started my high school volleyball team, and this is back in 2002, I hated my coach with a passion. I didn't think they knew what they were doing. She didn't respect me. I didn't respect her. And, and we, we got a team going, but it was miserable. It was awful. Granted, the team's still going now. So something did something, we did something right. But I just, if you don't have respect between your coaches and your players, you're going to butt heads till the end of the earth. So the only thing I can say is if you're a new program, you got to be able to roll with the punches. You can't just butt heads with your teammates or with your students. So you can go to the next one, Mel. So cultural grit is, uh, is a term I just kind of found the other day when I was reading a book. And I think it really goes to what I try and build with my program. Um, my number one thing is resilience and belief. Um, our number one goal every day of practice is just to get better. It's just to believe that we can we can win no matter what. Um, belief is a, my, my volleyball coach in college, his name is Charlie Sullivan. He, uh, most people don't know division three men's volleyball, um, but they have won 11 of the last 13 national championships. He's a, he's a legend in the coaching ranks of division three. And he just wrote a book about, um, it's called the, the game of belief. And it's about how, when it gets down to crunch time, all you need is belief. You need to have undoubted positive belief that you are going to be successful. So I found out my first year coaching that having kids, you know, in League of Legends, if something goes wrong 12 minutes into the game, I got the, well, that's FF, like there's nothing left we can do here. The game's over. And I didn't, I couldn't wrap my head around the fact that, what do you mean the game's over? Like it's only 12 minutes in, what are you talking about? Um, and it took a long time for them to realize that yes, a lot of things can are gonna have to happen for you to win, but we have to believe that we can win. Um, and that that belief, that sense of, even though we're down, we can still win, that's gotta be a cultural thing. If you have kids giving up right at the drop of a hat, you, your, your ship is sunk before it's even left the harbor. Um, and I have believe under here, under believe, I'm a Buffalo Bills fan living in Massachusetts. 
Um, so I have had the short end of the stick for 20 years with Tom Brady up here in Massachusetts, but we're good this year. And we made the playoffs last year. And, you know, everyone always says like, who would have thought that? Well, well I did, I believed. And I, I'm a, I believed in, in what I was passionate about and what I, what I wanted to pour my energy in. And, and eventually it will come through whether you, other people think so or not. Um, in terms of cultural grit, um, communication in difficult situations. Uh, I found this more so this year because I have middle school kids on my um, my varsity team. Uh, one of my seventh graders last year was a grand champ in Rocket League and he was too young to play. So I had to figure out how to keep that kid interested in the program when he was too young to actually participate, even though he was scrimmaging my varsity team and beating him three on one for the most part. So I've had to learn that um, difficult situations, you have to be able to communicate with your players. Um, he was very upset that he couldn't participate, and rightfully so, but we, we, we talked to him and we had him sort of help coach, so to speak, and, and do some VOD reviews and everything else. Um, but we really needed to communicate with him that just because he couldn't play, there was a light down the end of the road for him. Um, and the importance of a captain. My first year, I had uh, Justin, who's my assistant coach now, and he was the guy that I started this all with. Um, and I relied on him like you would not believe. But if we had an issue coming, you know, something with the team, I would get a message at Discord at two o'clock in the morning that he just went off on somebody playing, you know, solo queue. And it was, it, he learned that he had to carry himself differently and he had to communicate differently because him just yelling at everyone didn't, doesn't work the way that it worked for him. If somebody said, hey, you're playing terrible, step your game up that's great. But if somebody yelled, all bets were off, you know? So, so communication is something as a team, the, the negativity, I mean, I'm a, I'm a super positive person. They all hate me because I'm uber positive all the time, like bubbly. It's just who I am and how I sort of operate. And, and they wouldn't, they couldn't understand the fact that I was always happy all the time and always finding the good in something, you know, they lost, they got spanked and beaten 18 minutes in league, but we, we I somehow tried to find a positive of it because it makes no use to, to, to harp on the negativity. Um, process versus product. And this is something on our team that I really, really, really stress. And it goes back to my volleyball coach from college. Um, don't worry about the product. Don't worry about that end result. Worry about the process to get there. If you control the process, the product will come. And I can't remember how many times in practice we just heard process, process over product, process over product. And I repeat it to myself every day during practice. Guys, process over product. It's, it, don't worry that you just died. You, the mechanics of that fight in League of Legends, you did what you were supposed to and you got better. So keep working on that process because in the end game, when you get down to it, in the nitty gritty, in the cultural grit, when when rubber's got to meet the road, you're going to have that process behind you to fall back on. Um, and winning and losing, I think everyone here understands that it's not just winning and losing, um, especially for me in interscholastic um, esports. I, I could care less if we go 0 and 16. Um, I want to prepare these kids to be better people than I got them. And I think esports, traditional sports, show, prove that, that you can, you can uh, change a kid over the course of their high school collegiate career. Um, and on the right, it's just the things that you can you can change. I got growth mindset on there twice because it's something that I really believe in. And I don't know why I put it in there twice, but it came out twice. So we'll talk about it. Uh, but growth mindset is just that that it's there's never a can't. It's just I'm not there yet. You know, and I say that to my two and a half year old when he can't build blocks that you know, it's not that you can't. You're just not there yet. Um, and a lot of kids aren't there yet and they get very down on themselves. So just trying to bring up that growth mindset that you're not there yet, but we'll get there. That positivity. Um, toxicity in high school kids when when uh, it hits the fan they uh, they turn to turn the other way and it's about building resilience and the fact that if, if something goes bad to not turn nasty but learn to way to make it better um, character development teamwork are all things that we're trying to develop at the high school level and it really has nothing to do with wins and losses just the fact that they're playing this game as a team together in a room after school you know to get better and I think that through esports we can and the culture of our program, you can really try and mold these kids. So when they get off to college, to, to a job, they can go back to some of these things they learned at eSports in a computer lab at you know three o'clock in the afternoon and it really makes them a better person, so. Thanks, Kyle. Yep. So, hey, I wanna talk to y'all a little bit about what we do before when I look at a team, before I build a team, uh, when students come to me with interest, I look at what I'm going to do to talk to those students. And this addresses to some degree the Q&A question up there. I'll talk about how we can do this virtually to a certain degree. 
start with ourselves. You can't coach students without having a clear view in your mind of what kind of coach you want to be, what you're going to bring to the table. You have to be someone who is consistent to these kids. That's, uh, you might hear this called a teaching strategy in some cases. I'm going to propose three of them here. I'm going to speak a little bit to each one, starting with the builder. You're there first. Day one, if you're there coaching a program, they're expecting you to be the foundation. You're going to be setting the stones in place. You get to decide what builds that program into where it's going to be. That's their perception. When I say that the first stone step should always be trust, I'm saying that the relationships, the same thing that Kyle emphasized between you and the students has to come first and foremost when you're building a new team in an existing program or a new program from scratch. You need to understand why they're interested in playing, what else they're interested in doing, where they're going. And I'm going to say that uh, trust with the students is critical to the success of a team, because if the team members trust you and they trust not just you, but each other, then the team is going to be far more successful than in any other situation. And that doesn't always happen right away. That can take time. That can be really hard in some cases. How do we recruit students? Recruiting is always interesting because you have a limited number of people. In the case of a high school, especially, you have to work with the student population you have. And you have a way you're going to reach those students or you're not. You can mention it in events where all the students are present. You can toss it into a school paper. You can send out an email. The reality is that when I've worked with recruitment, every year the successful mediums have changed. This year it was chalk. Chalk on the sidewalks was more effective than any emails we sent, than any social media we posted in finding new members and new competitors. Chalk on sidewalk, that was it. Two years ago, we did a social media Pinterest post that got 20 new members interested in the club, four of which became competitors. I would never have seen that. Pinterest isn't what I do, but it was something a student was passionate about, and they were right. There was an untapped group there waiting to be hit. So as a builder, when you build trust with students and you want to look at that for the purpose of looking at uh, building your community, that trust builds up an understanding of what they're passionate about, but also what they bring to the table outside of competition. This is going to be a big thing for most programs because the things they bring <clears throat> that doesn't, excuse me, throat's been dry today. The things they bring to the table that isn't their skill as a competitor are still incredibly important to what your program achieves, which gets into the mentor, providing resources, not solutions. If someone says, how do I become an excellent mid laner? Or someone says, how do I work in a three-man team for uh, for Fortnite, it doesn't work the same as in a three-man team for Rocket League. You can tell them all sorts of things. You can tell them all sorts of anecdotes. You can give them practices to do. I emphasize providing them resources because the answer for what works for them is never going to be the same as the next kid. Not once in my experience have I coached someone and said they're going to get this particular solution exactly the same and gain exactly the same things from it as the last kid I helped. But if you give them the means to build it themselves, they'll build something that makes sense to them. And you can always, after they've built their own solution, help them refine it further. And that's something where it's iterative. And you're teaching them not just to follow you when you do that. I'll talk to that in the next slide. Uh, the third thing, third strategy, and I think this is also critical as a coach and as a mentor or advisor, is to be clear on what your role is to the students. You're there to guide them. You're there to lead the way and set the expectations. We're doing this many practices. They're at this time. We're going to do VOD reviews on Thursday, whatever the case may be. But then if you entrust, say, a team captain to go ahead and lead that VOD review, you trust them to lead it. You give them the opportunity, and you make them clear to them that they can talk to you if they want help. You make it clear to the students that they can talk to you if they think that there's something else that should be done. But you give them that opportunity to lead because that's what's going to develop them as more than just competitors. It's going to make them into people who can follow in our own shoes as well and get the most of the program. Uh, I've said this. I work in data for a living as part of one of the things I do. 
And there was a study that came out in the state uh, about a year and a half ago now, two years ago now, actually, that looked at student competitors in high school, people who joined things like the esports programs. And how did they achieve when they hit college? Higher GPAs, better community involvement. These students were better scholastically in high school. And in the case of the students who were in the esports programs, uh, we heard stories about individuals who had never had an opportunity to ever compete before, be on a team before, because of health issues and disabilities, that this opened an entire new world for them. And they were able to do so much because of it. It was amazing. Uh, ready to go on to the next slide, Mel? And what is it that we do once we've picked our strategies to make sure that these students can step up and become leaders themselves, become coaches themselves, become all those things both alongside us and after they leave our programs in addition to their competition? Because at the end of the day, I don't care if they win or not so much as that they competed, they gave it their best, and they were happy with how they gave their best. If they're satisfied with their performance and they pushed themselves in a way that was healthy, I am thrilled, regardless of what happens at the end of the game. I try to track changes. This is something that's always fun. No one likes to do documentation. It's always the last thing done on any project for anything. And, and I tell a coach to write things down. You got to do documentation on your students. I can already hear groans, even with no audio coming from the, the viewers. What do you write down? What am I saying to write down? Of course, you write down the names of your students. You've got a roster, but write down other things. You know that one of the students is really passionate about journalism for some reason. Write it down. You know a student is a really good team player and another one might be rude to their op opposition or something. Write those facts down. They're things you can work on or lean into as strengths later. And don't just write down about your competitors, but if you recognize things in the community that are impacting them, other students, track those students the same way. Let's say you have a student in a media club that always covers your Rocket League team. Pay attention to what they care about and pay attention to what they're doing that's impacting your students because their coverage can change your team dynamic. And when they cease to be the person covering your team, that can change your team dynamic without any input from you. You wanna be able to see that. Let's say you have a star player who always does two-man games with a friend who isn't in your team, doesn't follow the structure of your team, doesn't do anything politely, and is a bad influence on that player. You can see that person has an influence on the player. You can see the relationship. You have options then if you have a track on that, if you have visibility to that, you have options. You could try to bring that player into the team as an alternate or as a community member and get them to understand your method and to pick up these good behaviors so they both improve. Maybe that'll happen, maybe it won't. Sometimes you do have to cut students loose, but you have that option if you have visibility. And that gets into group dynamics. When you build a team, let's say you've got five people on your team, that team is not gonna work the same as the next one. Anytime that you've had one person leave from a workplace, anytime you have a new student come in from outside, the bigger the team is, the bigger the group is, the harder it is to notice the differences, but there are always differences. And in a competitive space, that can be magnified. Let's say you have someone come in who's another star player. Your pre-current star player is fine with uh, listening to their players and working together, but they just can't work together with this new player. But both of them can work with everyone else. It's a new dynamic. And I don't think you need to build a new wheel. You don't have to build a whole new engine to do this. I'm recommending checklists. I've even got a link to a sample checklist because uh, in anything you do with managing groups or communities or even inside of an organization that's as big as Play Versus, checklists are magic. They are the simplest thing that gets the job done. Why would you make it harder on yourself? So have a checklist of how many practices you should made that week. Uh, have a checklist of attendances, have a checklist of whether you've learned uh, enough about what your students' interests are for you to see how that ties into their involvement in esports, or if you know about how they're getting support from their uh, community at home. Because something you'll run into a lot with these students is that unlike with traditional sports, they don't have parents who might be enthusiastic. A lot of times they don't have parents who understand what they're into, what their interests are. They're going into the wild blue 
yonder, they're doing something that's never been done before in their family, and they're all on their own. You are going to pay a bigger role in supporting them than anyone else will if esports is the place that they put their passion and that's not their back home. It's not the same for traditional sports in that sense in any regard. And that's a big thing that uh, every coach learns sooner or later is they've got students like that. And when they realize that you're someone that they can connect to, you can do magical things for how they succeed later in life. Back to you, Mel. Thank you. Thank both of you. I'm going to try to share this checklist so everyone can see it. Um, so give me just a second. I'll drop it into chat. Thank you. Yeah. I don't know if you'd want to talk through it. Oh, this is just an example. I put in some filler information right there. It's just a tiny URL link, so it's easy to link. It's just a Google Sheet. Uh, the idea is you want to track a couple of facts about your students that are relevant to you and your program. If you have Fortnite and Rocket League and you have people who play both, you want to know who plays both and who plays just one. Because even if you have a team that's Fortnite, you have a team that's Rocket League, if they're inside of your program, these people are going to know each other for sure. And the people who are on both or play both, they're going to be impacted by that when they talk to these other people. Uh, I didn't put any real names in here. All the details are made up. It's just an example. You can make a copy of it. Uh, yeah. you, you click on file, make a copy. It doesn't let you make a copy. Mm -hmm. uh, let me check my sharing settings and fix that. Sorry about that. OK, reload it, and it should work now. That's okay. I can make a copy and I have the ability to share it. So I will, I will do that for everyone. So no worries there. Um, again, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the QA. We have some pre-submitted questions. So I'm going to flip back to our presentation. Thank you, Stephen and Kyle. Um, so you all kind of addressed this one, but I'm going to go ahead and ask it again, just to make sure that it gets addressed this time. Um, for League of Legends and Smite, how do you hold tryouts? Um, they don't want to put the roles arbitrarily. And then to add to that, and I know that this definitely got brought up, is any suggestions on how to get kids to play the support role? That seems to be the least amount of interest for them. Anyone? Al or? I'll, I'll take uh, at least the, the second part where, you know, how to get the kids to play support. I mean, I think as a, as a program, you, you kind of got to sit everyone down and say, all right, this is the five things we need to make this goal achievable. And, and as a team, we're going to have to work together to try and figure out how to make that achievable. And so it be as simple as, uh, you know, if you if you stream make sure we highlight that support player during the stream make sure we if we do interviews or anything like that bring up that support player just bring up the role of a team not so much single out each player mid lane or top whatever just say as a team as a unit and keep pushing that we're a team we're a unit we're a family you know just like any other traditional sport you know every football team says oh we're just a big family we're a band of brothers da, 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 da. it's the same thing on an esport team you know they, everyone has their their spoke in the wheel so to speak and, and you just got to kind of say you know if we got to make this work we got to kind of everyone has their own part we got to play great thank you kyle justin do you have anything you want to add to that uh, yeah, if I, I'll handle the, the first part of it. Um, for League of Legends, how do you hold uh, tryouts? Uh, basically, if you have a lot of people going for the, the same position, it's easy to look at like their solo queue rank and then determine, like, oh, this kid's gold and this other one's iron. Let's let's go with the gold kid, of course, if you're going to you know have a, a like a varsity team. But if it's something where uh, it's, it's pretty contested, one of the things I'll look at a lot is communication in game how they're working uh, with their teammates. Uh, some of the factors that you would look at um, beyond the realm of whether they're 
whether they win the game or lose the game is uh, their creep score. How well did they farm if they're if they're a laner, if they're top mid or or bot lane. Um, also, their rotations around the map. Um, are they com and that all kind of boils down to communication other than the CS. But if they're communicating with their other teammates as far as being proactive around the map, making plays, uh, moving around, securing neutral objectives, uh, things of that nature. But if you're unfamiliar with League of Legends and this is all kind of new to you and Smite the same way, uh, if you're unfamiliar with either of those games and how they how they play, um, the communication, I, I would say, would be the major thing because you're not going to be able to detect um, those, those micro mechanics and how good the player uh, really is if you're unfamiliar with how the game is actually played. Uh, you may be looking at their score line and say that, you know, they died five times in that match. Well, that may not that may not necessarily be a bad thing. It may not even totally be their their fault. It could be because they're trying to be the leader and and the rest of the team isn't necessarily following up. So uh, those are the things I would look at and also um, their attitude, uh, de uh, how the game is going. If they're snowballing the game and they're they're really dominating the other team, are they handling it uh, gracefully? Uh, and, and likewise, if the team is losing, uh, do they self-reflect and think about how they could have done better in that in that situation instead of blaming their teammates so those instantly um, help me with knowing who do i want on my team in order to propel it towards a, a positive culture great thank you um steven do you want to add anything or sure uh, we've had times where we've had too many players to fit one team but not quite enough for two and it's common that we'll have people who are very good but we don't have enough spots for them to play the role they want uh, I've not, not had the specific problem where we didn't have a support. We have added a problem where we didn't have a jungler. And what we did is we did a sort of rotation where we took the players and we asked them, okay, look, all of you want to play your particular roles that you're passionate about, but you're going to need to know a bit about the other roles too to be the most effective in your role. And right now, sure. nobody wants to play this particular role. So for fairness, we're going to make it to where everybody takes turns swapping into other roles. Everyone picks up a secondary role, maybe compared to their primary, but then everybody also does time playing this role, jungler, and learning the mechanics and how it works with their positions. It turned out that that was amazingly valuable because we had several players who were so so caught up on their positions that they didn't realize how to cooperate with the jungler and being in the role of the jungler and playing in the role of the jungler ended up training them on what to look for when working with someone else who's a jungler. And it got to be where they didn't actually uh, really mind being jungler as much because they got to do new things and talk new tactics with the exception of one student. There's always a holdout in some cases that one student was so upset that he couldn't play in the position he wanted that he basically said he was gonna quit the team. So I said, okay, he didn't quit the team, but he was very grumbly for the rest of the year. <laughs> Yeah, so that kind of leads into our next question. I think we get this every time we have a chat with super coaches is what are some tips for handling teams or players that display unsportsmanlike conduct that are too good for the team? Um, kind of that whole idea of just not being part of that positive culture. Um, at least for me, I, I draw the line in the sand. Um, I have a, a, a white piece of paper with red ink that says no toxic, no toxicity that I have laminated and hung up. And it's kind of a joke on the team. If somebody's getting to be the point where, you know, that being very unsportsmanlike, you know, they get the no toxicity banner put right in front of their computer. Um, it's just not something as a culture that, or even as, a, as our, our school, we would tolerate, you know, we wouldn't tolerate taunting on any of our other teams. We certainly don't taunt, tolerate it for our esports team. So that's just something that I, uh, you know, even before I knew what esports was and, and I found out what toxicity was, that was, that was a big no. That was a hard pass right from the get-go. And the kids understand that that's what I take it. And I don't joke at you. I mean, I don't even like them swearing when they're on comms because I, we never know when we're streaming, who's streaming. That just, it's something that, that they know if it comes out, you hear somebody yell swear jar. We don't really have a swear jar, but at least it makes them cognizant of what they're saying. Um, so it's really for, especially in interscholastic and in high school, I just put the hard line in the sand. If you can't follow the rules, you're not going to be here. And, you know, and, and somebody said, 
in chat that they have trouble getting me, you know, three for Rocket League. I have three for Rocket League. So if one of those kids wants to be a, you know, a, a dink and say something stupid, well, then two other kids are going to suffer the consequences for his actions. And they needed to learn that. And uh, we had a season zero. I had a kid that got banned from League of Legends and, and we weren't sure if he was even going to be able to play in our playoff match. And, and he learned quickly that his actions affected for other people. And it's, it's a, it's a matter of what we're teaching them for life of whether or not their, their actions have repercussions. And if they're going to say something dumb, it's going to affect the people around them. And it's kind of just one of those things. It's a, it's a non-negotiable for, for my team, at least that we, we just don't do that. And if we see it, we, we address it right away. Steven, do you want to add a piece? Thank you. I'd, I'd like to. Toxicity is always something that we have to be mindful of when we're working with students. It's very easy for someone who is younger and more easily influenced and more immature to make decisions that haunt them for the rest of their life, let alone semester. When I'm dealing with toxicity in my players, one of the things I try to do is understand what levers I have to influence them to recognize what they are doing and to address it. When I throw in their face, hey, you're being toxic, you need to cut that out or you're done, that doesn't necessarily have the same impact as saying, hey, you and I need to talk. I need to know what's going on with you right now. Saying that I can say, okay, I'm gonna contact your advisor for your program and let them know that I'm running into these things with you and that you need to talk to them. Saying I'm gonna send them to disciplinary action. S different things motivate different kids. Some people don't care if you kick them out of the program because they're so angry already for something that has nothing to do with your program. Some kids are gonna absolutely change in a heartbeat if they can get over the thing that's bothering them. And other kids are going to just spit vitriol no matter how hard you try they'll smile and nod their head to you and then do it again the second you turn your back you can communicate to these kids your expectations on day one up front communicate to them where your where your lines are in the sand it makes a big difference but it's also going to in some cases restrict how many kids you're going to get and i know that for some of you coaches where you've got two kids and you need a third that's a hard decision to make is how firm of a line do you draw on the sand when it might cost you even having a team that year Get to know the kids, get to know what's bothering them, get to know what is really going on in their heads, and you may find other ways to turn them around. You can have them practicing and say, until this cleans up, we can't go ahead and compete. That's a way to have a team without actually going out there and putting them out there representing your school if they're not ready. But be aware of all the tools you got in your toolbox. Hammer sometimes the right one, but it's sometimes gonna take a little more finesse. Thank you. I'm sure your uh, checklists come in handy for that too, getting to know them and writing down what motivates them. It was not so practical once I broke 50 people in the program. I, I admit I don't checklist as well as I used to. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense for sure. And I think one of y'all mentioned team captains and that might be another approach as your programs get bigger kind of teaching the team captains or your assistant coaches to be that leader for you as well. Um, Justin, do you have anything you'd like to add? Yeah, sometimes the, uh, you know, don't treat it any different than you would a traditional athletic coach would. And um, is, if you have those those subs available, you know, if you've got people that are on sportsman like or, or toxic, you, you bench them. And then the, the kid that's been dying to play gets to play. And uh, the, the biggest thing is, is, uh, nipping it as, as soon as it as soon as it occurs and as soon as you give them a little bit of of leeway in that then they start to really kind of push it and see what your limits are and if you never establish those limits um, you know early then it's going to kind of get away from you um, a couple other things too is making sure that you establish that culture for sportsman sportsmanship and and lack of toxicity or or being non-toxic early um, one of the things i uh, impressed to my 
uh, athletes was to just completely disable chat in the game um, and also designating only one representative from our team to chat with the other team at all times. Uh, this, so that would be like if we're in the lobby and we need to discuss, you know, which who's who's going to start uh, blue side or red side. I have one person, I have the captain that does that. It's just going to keep a lot of the chat down, keep a lot of the uh, the chances for something wrong uh, happening. So they have their chat disabled. That's me just trying to prevent them from being able to do that. Um, but it also allows them to have that team atmosphere because um, you don't have that in, again, traditional sports. So I like to use traditional sports um, as a model. And again, uh, kind of like uh, I believe Kyle said it, um, you know, pressure from from other students or from their other team members sometimes it means a lot more to them than pressure from the coach so if they know the entire team is depending upon them and you know we just if we're not going to compete tonight because you decided to make some poor decisions on tuesday then you're not just letting me down you're letting down the entire team and sometimes that can have uh some very uh weighty um you know, impacts and effects on them. So I would definitely encourage you to at least try some things in, in that regard. Excellent, thank you. Um, before we address this last one, I want to address the question that is in the chat or in the QA feature is, do you have any suggestions for building that team re report virtually? That's definitely a 2020 question. Um, <laughs> Building team report. I mean, that's what I'm dealing with right now. My Rocket League team plays, uh, you know, from home. My Overwatch team comes into school to play. Um, and my Rocket League team, it, it's tough to get them all there at the same time when they have the comfort of their living room. So that's something I think that whoever asked that question, you are not the only one who is dealing with that right now. Um, what I found that helped my guys kind of come together was we started streaming their practices. Um, it kind of got them to focus a little better as a team. Um, we started off just streaming it for me via just sharing their Discord screen. Um, and that was just a way for me to A, watch their practice, but they also took it as um, kind of a tryout to, to stream it on our Twitch channel for the school. Um, and then we started to actually stream some, you know, one of them was streaming from his personal Twitch, and then we streamed one from the school Twitch, and, and just streaming and just showing them that they're working together, that now what they're doing, the public can see, kind of made them come together as a team a little bit. Um, but it is certainly difficult to try and build some rapport over a screen and a microphone. Um, so um, that's, that's what I used. I used streaming as a, as a carrot for my kids to kind of come together. Thank you. Uh, I would add to try to find ways to get them together um, with the thing that they love, which is which is gaming um, in something that's not always uh, competition. I feel like that was something that that helped quite a bit. There are a lot of uh, cool little games, especially like League of Legends. You know, they could do an ARAM or um, you know mix up the rules a little bit and you know restrict certain champions and little things you could do where they're not always um, competing and having that pressure and the stress because once once you flip that switch and you're competing um, they have that innate desire to you know blame their teammates and then we just have uh, just a lot of you know negativity that could brew but if they have those moments where they can just you know kind of let loose and uh, have fun together I think that also uh, builds that rapport as well that's a great point I know that um I've played with some people in Fortnite that do four corners. And so when they squat up, instead of playing all together, you have to go on the separate corners of the map and try to meet all together. So that's like playing a game without necessarily having to play as a team, but also not playing against each other. Um, so that, that's a great idea. Of course, we all love Among Us. So playing Among Us or Jackbox, any of those fun non-competitive um, games. Um, Steven, do you have anything? I know you, you do a lot with your players. Did it send? I'm looking to see. Okay, I, I put a written answer on that with some strategies. Oh, great. Matt, there's oh, yeah. different, different ways. I'm going to read really... them out if you don't want to talk about them. Either way. Harvey, I can, I can talk about it. It's fine. You talk uh, about it. I'd much rather have you talk. Sure. So. 
your resources are going to vary from program to program. If you're in a high school, maybe you have a Discord for the kids, or maybe you're limited in the communications there. Virtual can mean a lot of things. But office hours are powerful. When there's a student who has a problem and they know they can reach you at this time, there's a window to talk to you. If they know that the door is open and you are there for them, that can help. You'll have a lot of office hours that are empty of time. Have a backup plan for what you do. Work on your Sudoku or something. But keeping that door open can be meaningful. One-on-ones after practices, like rotate it. Like, hey, I want to talk to one student after each practice about how their practice has been going, what their takeaways are, how they think the other members are doing. That builds a report with that student and also lets you get some insights into the team without having to hold everybody captive necessarily, which can be hard to do with a virtual group. One-on-ones, it's basically cornering a kid, unfortunately, but it's with good intention. I like the idea of streaming, like it was said there, that's, that's powerful. But even if you can't stream it, like let's say you can't put it out there for one reason or another, recording it still has an impact on sportsmanship because when they know that their behavior and their audio is recorded, kids change their way they act. They shape up to some degree. That shows that they're to some degree conscious of what they're doing too. So knowing the difference between their performance when they aren't recorded and when they are powerful stuff for you as a coach to know where the problem areas lie. I like the idea of doing casual game nights like anything. Uh, we had a game called Crunker IO, which was super simple that everyone got into one year. We basically joked that we had an unofficial Crunker esports team that was literally four of our five teams combined, plus one other random person who wasn't even on the teams because we had a community involved. And they get on there on Crunker and they would just screw around for like a half hour, three or four times a week, random times, different people would call for it. It was hugely popular. And those people ended up becoming really good friends because of it in a lot of cases, because that was a reason for them to hang out and socialize. Doing things that aren't tied to the team where you're competing and performing are always powerful for making them stronger friends. Even as, if it's as simple as doing chalk on a sidewalk together or a bake sale, it does work. Guided icebreakers. And what I mean by that is you have them doing something maybe before practice or something else where you're coming in and telling them what the scenario is and what they're working on. Like you talked about the Arams, that's a kind of competitive icebreaker to a certain degree, but you can do it with other ways socially too. We got to talk about their favorite foods and explain to you which position their favorite food would play if it was on a team. And then they have to go ahead and give them a power ranking. So you've got the S rank foods gone down as if they were, uh, top laners or, or supports. Get, give them something that gets them out of the mode of thinking about this entirely seriously, and you can get them to open up to a certain degree and build something of a relationship. I, I think that's it. that's a pretty good way to go for things. Yeah, um, this was more on like a teacher side, but I saw to share something that it's unimportant about you. It puts less pressure on coming up with something unique and different and then being like, nah, I like PB and J sandwiches, they're the best. Um, and they would be a good support, right? That's, that's really fun, I love it. Um, we have one more question that popped up. It's any good resources out there for coaches, like how to set up streams? I'm not gonna lie, I have my kids set it up. I, <laughs> I, I have the passwords and everything, but I, I most of the time let them handle it. That's. That's one of those things I've passed the bucks off to them. Because no, uh, because I, I don't want to interrupt, but no, if they're, if they're serious gamers, they're streaming already for the most part. So they probably know what they're doing already. Sorry, Justin, um, go ahead. No, you're good. I would say reach out to, to, uh, to Twitch because they have a, um, a student program, a Twitch student program, and they will provide you with a lot of information um, that way. And it's it also fast tracks your program to like affiliate and partner status um, with Twitch. So you can begin generating revenue off of your streams for your organization. So um, we recently just did that here at, at Spring Hill. And it's a, it was kind of a lengthy process, but um, once it, once they, they sent me a lot of stuff I already knew um, just from playing with OBS and stream labs and, you know, things of that nature. I've been streaming for a, a while. So it's one of those where I don't have like one document, but I do uh, recall once we got that set up with Twitch, they sent me a lot of things. Um, it's called the Twitch student program. 
so Twitch student program. And it basically, if you're, um, you know, a, an educational institution, then they, again, they fast track you to, um, like affiliate or program, I forget, affiliate or partners. Basically, they have different uh, levels, uh, but you start off at uh, like affiliate status. And then once your stream, once you stream so many hours out of a week for so many weeks in a row and reach so many views, then they bump you up to the next level. And it's it's really cool. And then that gives the students um, incentive, you know, because once you get that that partner status, then you can start generating revenue. And so it almost gives them like a another goal, you know, something to do other than just competing uh, they're also trying to build their program and once you know they're laying the foundation there for for future uh, generations or, or future years of your athletes that come through uh, your program so I would definitely reach out to that and start setting it up um, and they provide you with a lot of information to get it going excellent I hadn't heard of that one yet that's exciting yeah, uh, and it was actually did an interview process, by the way, in order for me to, to get involved in it. I had to meet with them for about 30 minutes and explain what what the vision was and what we were trying to do. And um, fortunately, I came in with some of that knowledge, but it, it's, it was a really cool experience um, and a great way to get your streaming program going. Yeah, um, I think Kyle mentioned this and we had another super coach talk about this. But if you're a teacher and taking your prep period, and practicing streaming during your prep period. Uh, John Alfred does like a coach shows you how not to play League of Legends or something like that. And so he would just kind of practice and get better at the game. So it kind of was twofold. He was learning the game a little bit more, but then he was also learning how to stream. Um, so definitely something you can look into as well. I know. I Go ahead. I feel like some of these questions, like how do we set up a stream and such or technical questions that could be turned into a pretty easy cheat sheet. So if there's any other technical questions people want to do about their program or toss out here, like things that they would need as a coach just to get basic things done, Twitch, the Twitch uh, students is an excellent link. But let's say for whatever reason, your school wants to do it through play YouTube gaming or through Facebook gaming instead, uh, we can help put together some simple links for you very easily if we know what it is that you're struggling with. So please drop them in the Q&A. Okay, Philip, we'll get basic streaming links. That's a given. Yeah, any other questions um, that you would like to see? Or, because again, I will follow up with those links in an email so we can make sure that you all have them. Um, we can have our super coaches write out how they use it. Um, can I respond to Philip's question about recruiting? Yeah. Uh, Philip, we did a thing last year called the Mahar X. Um, it was an expo for our school. Um, and what it is, is we have a, a makerspace program that kind of, you know, it's a creative um, stem kind of class that decided to do this whole day where we just showcased what kids were doing over the year and i know it's probably a little weird this year because it's virtual um but what we did is we took our our league of legends team and, and we put them in the auditorium and we put computers set up on the stage and we streamed it behind them up on the screen and we had come kids come in and watch what they were doing and, and how it was going on and we streamed the the audio so they could hear what the kids were, were saying um, and that was a huge recruitment tool because the kids saw that it wasn't just, you know, uh, five kids sitting in the chairs, not talking to each other, you know, playing video games. They realized that there was a lot more that went into it. So that certainly helped our League of Legends program. Um, I, I hammer our middle school as hard as I can, just so when I get them to high school, that they'll be at least interested and know we have a program. Because I found out even this year, we've had a program for two years incoming middle school kids still have no idea that this thing exists you know and of course all they ask for is are we playing rainbow six are we playing call of duty whatever but you know now that we have overwatch i can kind of get some of those kids to, you know into esports with me but you know a lot of it was just the the eye opening for them that there, there is an avenue for them with gaming when they get to high school when they're in middle school um, and i even reached out to our elementary school principals and said, hey, we have this coming up. If you want to start doing Minecraft, some of these Roblox, some of these smaller games with the kids to sort of open their minds when they get to high school, it certainly helped out. And the elementary school principals were totally behind it. So that's something that I kind of used. Excellent. 
We've had some other schools talk about how they will go reach out to their middle school or any of the feeder schools and get them, you know, a team together. And that's their practice squad that they will practice against. Um, so we have one more question that popped up. This might be our last question. It's not really a question, but just kind of a statement of their brand new coach and they just need a place to start. So kind of as you're like parting words, where should a new coach start? I'll go first, know your why. Know why you're there and why your students are there. Um, if you're a new coach with brand new aspirations and they're new to, to eSports, you know, sit down and have a conversation together about what you're going to you know, expect from each other as a team. Um, why you're there coaching them, why they're there playing. I think knowing your why is a good place to start. Excellent. Steven? I agree. The why is very powerful. I think you should take some time with your own why before you approach the students so that you're standing on solid ground. It'll make a big difference in the conversation with them. If you come in already knowing the answer to where your position lies on certain things, but there's a lot of room to move even after doing that. Excellent. Um, we do have some other coach clinics that you can look into. We have one about practice that was last week and um, a few others coming up. Um, I'm going to kind of go over those really fast because I'm pretty excited about some of them. Tomorrow we have, if you are following our Game Changer conversations, we have women from the gaming industry that are coming and speaking. Um, this specific one is about self-advocacy and setting boundaries. We have Summer Scott from CLG, um, Dr. Lindsay Miglior, Miglior, I always say it wrong. Sorry, Lindsay, if you're watching, um, who is the gamer doc. She's a medical doctor who also games and has its passion for making healthy gamers. And then Amanda Stevens, who is working on inclusivity, works closely with C9 and Anyki. Then we will have a Rocket League VOD review workshop. So these are a little different where you can come in and ask your questions. We'll have a super coach here to talk through how they do VOD review. And it's more workshoppy than us just giving you information. And then our next coach clinic will be training with a purpose. We have a special guest, Brian Finn. He's been on some of our other coach clinics and he's going to be talking about training during your practice and really having a plan for your players. Um, I will put the link for our office, we call them super coach office hours because we're here to help you kind of like what Steven said, we're here to answer your questions, give you some information. Um, so you can go to the super coach office hours page to see all of our events and register. You can register for them all at once or click here and there. I highly recommend just registering for all of them, not because it helps me, of course, but you can get the recordings and any links that we share. So then you can kind of pick and choose which ones you want to watch when. Um, unless we have any other questions, please feel free to reach out to me or the super coaches. They're in Discord. They're here to help you. Um, thank you and have a wonderful evening. Thank you, panelists. I really appreciate it. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you for leading this, Mel. Yeah. And Justin, thanks for the backup cameo. Awesome surprise. <laughs> thank of course. You. <laughs> it's always great to have Justin. All right. I am going to end this so I can have dinner with my family. Have a good one. Dinner. That's what I was missing. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Bye.